Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan, and in today's video, we're gonna look at preparing dried insects for photography. We have talked frequently about preparing fresh insects for photography, or insects sometimes that have been stored in alcohol. But what we're talking about today is a completely different topic, how to prepare a dried insect. Before I begin, thank you to my Patreon supporters and the folks who are supporting me through my website. I really appreciate your help. Thank you. I have made a reference document, a chart that lays out all eight of the steps I'm getting ready to tell you about. It includes the names of the chemicals, where you can find them, the various tools and instruments that I use. To find the document, just go to my website. The link is right here. And when you get there, you'll see the PDF and you can download it and use it as a reference if you ever encounter a dehydrated insect. There are two ways you're likely to encounter a dehydrated insect. The first is you're going to find it. Oftentimes when an insect dies in the warm months anyway, you'll find them in your house or in your attic or in the garage sitting there dry as can be from the heat. The other way you'll find dehydrated insects is if you buy them. They are almost always mailed to you in the dehydrated condition, usually wrapped in a bit of plastic. Before I get into the eight steps for preparing a dehydrated insect, let me give you a word of caution about buying insects online. Insects are sold online for more than just photography. Some insect outlets sell their brightly colored insects for use as jewelry or uh, as interesting items to place in some kind of artwork. And in those cases, occasionally the insect will have been sprayed with some kind of a lacquer or preservative. You certainly don't want one of those. Insects are also sold to collectors, and a lot of time the sellers will remove the abdominal contents of large insects, and they'll sometimes snip off the whole abdomen of a butterfly. This is fine with collectors. Uh, it's not good for what we need, though. We don't want a nice big insect with an incision on its belly. So just make sure that you know what you're getting, and read the fine print. Uh, you'll find that insects are priced at different levels. The higher the price, the more uh, satisfaction is guaranteed. But at the lower prices, often the fine print will say, we, we are not responsible for antennas or limbs breaking off. Maybe a collector wouldn't be bothered by a missing antenna, but a photographer would be. So bear that in mind. Okay, so you've got your insect. It has both of its antennas, all of its limbs and wings. It looks pretty good, but boy, is it dry. These things have been baked at a very low temperature for quite a long time to ensure that all of the moisture is driven out of them. And in that condition, they do not make for good photographs. Maybe butterflies' wings uh, would, uh, but the majority of the insects are not going to look lifelike in that condition. So the first thing, step one, is to rehydrate the insect. Everybody has their own preference for how to rehydrate insects. This is the way I do it because it works. I use a particular container that comes from a New Zealand company called Systema. They make plastic dishes. You've probably seen me using these things in a number of different uh, places. They're wonderful. They seem to be more chemical resistant than most plastics. Uh, but anyway, this is the, the chamber that I use to rehydrate my insects. It has a, a, a good tight rubber seal, which holds it airtight. The lid clicks into place using these toggles uh, which really holds it closed and airtight. But the best thing is it has a second shelf inside. Now, it doesn't normally have a bunch of holes in it, uh, but I just take a, a lab pick like this, a very sharp one, get it red hot, and I punch holes all through it. Now, they make a bigger one of these that is good for rehydrating multiple insects, but I prefer using the smaller version 
and I have many of these because it'll allow me to do a few insects at a time and not have to worry about the huge um, uh, volume of the larger box for keeping uh, the humidity up. Into the bottom of the chamber, I put a stack of these raw cotton pads. They're, uh, I think they're used for putting on makeup, something I've never tried myself. Uh, but I buy these in, in uh, big bags from uh, Japan uh, and they're, they're wonderful. They hold the moisture forever and they hold a lot of it. Uh, you'll see people using all kinds of things like uh, paper towels. Uh, none of them work as well as cotton for me. So the way I use the chamber is make sure it's clean. I cover the whole bottom of the, the chamber with these cotton pads and then I soak them in water with a few drops of phenol. I use the phenol to prevent the growth of mold. You never know what kind of spores are on your insect when you buy it and when you put it in a warm, moist chamber. If there's mold, it'll start to grow and it will ruin an insect. I take a little square of cheesecloth, a decent quality cheesecloth, and uh, I wrap the insect in it. This is to keep at an even higher level of moisture right around the insect. And then I'll put the wrapped insects on the top tray of my uh, Systema chamber, like so, and then seal it. I'm not very good at this part, there we go. Seal it like that, put the box in a warm, dark place, and leave it there undisturbed for a day. After 24 hours, check your insect, open the box, unwrap the insect and take a look at it. If it's starting to look like a freshly killed insect, you're getting close. You'll know you're all the way there when the wings and the appendages and the antennas with terribly gentle touches move like you would expect from a fresh insect. Then you know you're rehydrated enough. Sometimes, for big beetles, for example, it can take three or four days to rehydrate it. And I don't hurry the process. I just keep adding a little bit of water and checking them twice a day. Every time you open the chamber to check if they're ready, be sure to add a few more uh, splashes of water and phenol to the cotton pads. Uh, the phenol is very volatile and when you open the lid, a lot of that phenol is going to get away. So adding uh, a few drops of phenol with your water is a really good idea. When it's ready, you can move on to step two. In step two and in step four, you examine your insect. After you think it's fully hydrated, examine it. Now, my preference is to examine it under a dissecting microscope. A low power binocular dissecting microscope is best. Another alternative is one of those bendy arm magnifying glasses with a, a ring light in it that you just position. They, I have one, it gives me a terrible neck ache trying to get my head in the right position for it. So I don't use it that much. The third way that I use on big insects like big beetles is I've got this visor that's got magnifying glasses in the eyepieces. It's a bit embarrassing to be seen wearing it, but it also has a light at the top. So you can get pretty close to big insects that way, but the gold standard is to use a microscope. Now you're examining the insect in step two to make sure that, that all of the, the parts that need to move, move so that you'll be able to pose them. To do that, I usually use very fine, depending on the size of the insect, very fine uh, brushes. I don't know what these are made for, but th that's what I use them for. They've only got a couple of bristles on them. This is what a not rehydrated wasp looks like. Everything is fixed and it doesn't bend. So after examining your insect and satisfying yourself that it is sufficiently rehydrated, the next step is step three. And in step three, we relax the insect as needed. Now, rehydration is a relaxing step and it is possible for some small insects 
uh, that just rehydrating is all you need. So if the rehydration didn't give me enough flexibility of the limbs for me to position the insect the way I want it, then I'll use one of two targeted relaxation methods. Typically, the way I do it is I will try to relax the insect with the first recipe, and if that doesn't work, I'll do it again with the second. So the first method I would try would be to take a mixture of ammonium hydroxide with sodium laurel sulfoacetate, which is a, a cheap available surfactant, and I'll dip the, the, the offending limbs in that solution and now I'll put the insect back in the rehydration box for uh, anywhere from 6 to 24 hours and take it out and check it. If there is no improvement at the end of a day of sitting in there, then what I'll do is I'll move on to choice number two. The second and slightly more aggressive solution is to make a mixture of pepsin powder, that's the enzyme that our stomachs make, uh, mixed with hydrochloric acid and you only need a little acid in some water and add the pepsin and that will activate the pepsin. It's the pepsin itself that breaks down the connective tissues that are holding the limb extended and it'll usually work pretty quick if you have treated the limb uh, using usually a q-tip by the way. I'll put the mixture all around the, the joint that's stuck and uh, give it an hour or two to, to dissolve. If that doesn't do it, go buy another insect because <laughs> anything else you do is just going to dissolve the leg. Once you are happy that all of the limbs, wings, and antennas are supple enough that you can position the insect the way you want it, and this is especially important if you're going to be posing the insect in flight, for example. Uh, you've got to make sure that the elytra, the hard coverings on the, the wings of a beetle, are also uh, completely uh, relaxed so that they'll open up and you can spread the wings. Once you're satisfied with the degree of relaxation you have, step four, re-examine the insect under your microscope. In this step, you need to look at the insect really, really carefully, because not only are you trying to identify whether or not there's any dirt or contaminant there, you also want to try to characterize what it is. Some insects, after they die, when they're dehydrated, release oils and uh, form a greasy substance on the surface of the insect, and this is really difficult to get rid of. Others will produce a waxy covering and you'll you'll see the, the the difference you'll often see it in hairy insects like bees uh, oftentimes their hair will be really matted with a, an oily or waxy uh, covering the reason you need to know this is because in the next step we're going to be talking about cleaning the insect Cleaning a dried and rehydrated insect is different than just cleaning an insect. You know, with fresh insects, we rinse them off, we toss them in the ultrasonic cleaner or just run them under a little water or move them back and forth in a tub of warm, soapy water. That would destroy a dried insect. If you took an insect out of its packet and put it under running water, all the bits would fall off. That's why you have to rehydrate it first. So when we get to this point, you want to avoid doing anything to the insect that it doesn't need. So once you've got a good idea what you think needs to be cleaned, then you can apply targeted cleaning. Now, if you see a lot of dust or sand or particulate matter that looks just like you would expect to see on a live insect, Try very, very gently washing it back and forth in a slightly warm dishwasher detergent one drop solution of warm water. Oftentimes, just that movement will dislodge a lot of the, 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 the particles. Another option, be careful, is to use an ultrasonic cleaner. Rehydrated insects may have resilience similar to a, a freshly killed insect, but I wouldn't chance it. Uh, so if you are going to use an ultrasonic cleaner, use really short bursts, maybe uh, as little as five or 10 seconds at a time until you get the desired result. 
If on your examination, your insect has densely matted hairs, which with what looks like some kind of a greasy or waxy substance mixed in with the hair, then you're gonna to need to use one of two approaches. Now, my preference for cleaning away grease is to use dry cleaning fluid. Yep, that same stuff they use to clean your kilt. It's called tetrachloroethylene, and it has a very distinct aroma. But if you can't afford or don't want to buy a 44-gallon drum of dry cleaning fluid for your ant, uh, then what you can do is buy a little tin of brake cleaning fluid. This also contains tetrachloroethylene and in quite a high concentration. One can of this stuff will last you your entire life for cleaning insects because you don't need much. It's pretty poisonous, so you want to use it outside or in a well-ventilated area. It really helps to use a fine bristle brush or one of these tiny brushes. These are great for combing the hair on a bee. And also if you dip this in the brake cleaner, it will lift off a lot of that grease and oil. It doesn't work great on wax. Uh, and you'll know that if you've been cleaning your bee for a while and it's not coming off well at all, it's probably waxy buildup that it's got. If there's wax on it, about the only thing I've ever found that really works is this chemical called Cellosolve. Cellosolve is um, even nastier than tetrachloroethylene, but it will work on badly wax encrusted specimens. Aside from all the work you're going to do with the soap, and the water and the cellosolve and the tetrachloroethylene, you may still end up with ugly eyes. Eyes are especially difficult to clean, partly because uh, you can get away with some gunk on hairs uh, without it looking too bad. Uh, gunk on the eye itself looks terrible and it's very hard to get off. It doesn't usually come off with soap and water. It definitely doesn't come off in the ultrasonic cleaner and I wouldn't use brake cleaner on the compound eye. I think it's a little bit on the harsh side. So the way I clean badly gunky compound eyes is with a little bit of a fluid called Decon 90. Decon 90 is a blend of what are called surface active agents. They're, it's a mixture of different surfactants and wetting agents that act in different ways. So they become a very, very effective surface cleaning solution. Uh, it's used uh, in radiation decontamination so that when you're washed down with the stuff, it removes every possible particle of dirt. I wouldn't wash up the insect in it, but I paint the stuff onto the eyes uh, very, very gently with a, a slightly wider, but equally soft brush, very, very soft. And I'll dip it in the Decon 90 and I will brush the eye with it, never poking onto it, just brushing. And, uh, then I'll rinse it off with uh, a, a nice clean water rinse. Sometimes it takes multiple treatments and uh, I have had several occasions where I've never been able to get it back. But if you're taking the kind of high resolution images where the eye is the star, I would uh, invest in a can of Decon 90. You'll definitely use it. The best eye cleaner. So by the end of step five, you have a relaxed, clean, natural looking insect with bright eyes. You're ready to move on to step number six. I'm not gonna cover that in a whole lot of detail because we've done so previously. In step six, what I do is I position my insect for how I want to photograph it. Now, that can be as complicated as you want to make it. Uh, what I use are little squares of uh, foam core board. You know, you buy it in a gigantic sheet and then I cut it up into squares and I use insect pins of various sizes. Now understand 
we're not sticking these pins through the insect. No, not at all. What we're doing is we're using the pins to hold the limbs in position. And similarly with wings, you can gently spread them with a paintbrush and then put a pin on either side, not through the wing, just on either side to hold them in position. I've done whole videos on how to position and pose insects, and I'm not going to go into any more detail about it now. Make sure you use some nice, fine insect pins like the Enter a Crisis pins that I use. Uh, they're, they're really good for, for positioning. Now, once you've got the insect in the position you want to photograph it in, leave it alone. Leave it in a, a protected place. I use a, a plastic sieve that I use to rinse insects in. And when I am done with all of my work, I'll put them on the counter and put the sieve over the top of them because the mesh on it is really, really small. If you've ever spent four hours preparing an insect just to have another insect come along and eat the one that you've been working on, you'll know why this, this little bit of mesh makes sense. So cover it and let it dry. With step six completed, and after waiting long enough for the insect to dry again, you can remove it from the pinning board and go take some photographs. If you've done everything right and you've left enough time for the, the insect to dry in position, it shouldn't uh, move at all during your, your shooting. Which brings us to step number eight, the final step, and that is preserving your insect. Now, we talked a lot about preserving fresh insects. I use isopropyl alcohol, 93%, and uh, it does a, a very good job. To preserve your previously dehydrated and rehydrated insect, you have two options. One is to preserve it wet, but I don't use isopropyl alcohol like I do with fresh insects. Because of the dehydration process, their colors aren't as um, resistant to isopropyl as I would like. So I use denatured ethyl alcohol uh, to put them long term into wet storage. And that's my preferred method. One thing about wet preservation, doesn't matter what kind of alcohol you're using, do not leave the pin in the insect. It's often a temptation if you went to a lot of trouble to get the insect pinned perfectly. If you put the pin, even an enamel pin, into alcohol, it will discolor the insect. If I decide to dry store an insect, which I'll often do if I'm planning on photographing it again in a week or two weeks, uh, I'll put it in a small, completely airtight container. I'll add two things. I'll add a few crystals of paradichlorobenzene, which is one of the chemicals used in mothballs. It's also an effective mold retardant. In addition to that, I will add a tiny little silica gel packet. You find these things all over the place. That will help uh, get rid of any moisture that comes from the insect if the in internal parts of the abdomen are leaking moisture to the outside. That also will help prevent mold from forming. As a reminder, be careful around these chemicals. You're going to be using them in absolutely minuscule quantities, so you shouldn't encounter any problems, but just be careful. You don't want to eat any of this stuff. So that's it. Eight steps for cleaning previously dehydrated insects. I hope this was useful. Don't forget to run over the website. You can check out the article that I wrote on this subject, and that is where you'll find your free downloadable PDF as a reference guide for rehydrating insects. You'll also find some links to where you can get some of these weird chemicals. I'll see you again in a few days. I've got some shorts coming up and uh, another major project in the works. Until then, stay safe and be well.